Okay. Um, so a couple just Zoom info things. So if you see me looking over to my left, it's because I have a screen over there where I can see <laughs> what's going on. Um, also, I am using a script today just to help keep me on time and moving forward. So if you see me looking down and flipping pages, that's what I'm doing. Um, so we're going to go ahead and jump in and get started. And um, we might have a couple more people join in. So those of you who have just joined us, please feel free to use the chat function over on the right hand side of the screen to send us questions or comments as we go through. Um, at the very end, my email will also be available. If you want to send me questions directly, I understand that some of this might be private and things that you don't want to ask publicly, but please feel free to email me on your own and I'll be happy to respond and answer any questions that you have. Um, okay, so we're going to get started. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. My name is Whitney Brown. I'm an outpatient therapist here at Family Solutions. We have three offices, one in Greensboro where we're filming today, one in Archdale and one in Burlington. I am located in our Archdale office. Um, so my background is in working with student athletes, and so I wanted to provide you guys with some information, some hands-on ways to help your student athlete, your kid, um, cope with all of these COVID-19 changes and everything that's going on. Um, I do want to emphasize that this experience is really individual to everyone. My experience in my home is going to be different from your experience in your home. So I've tried to keep things sort of broad, like an umbrella overview of things. So if you have specifics, if there's something going on in your life that you feel like you need a little specific feedback on, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, so most of my research for this webinar was based on athlete transition and injury. We just don't have research yet on COVID-19. It's new. None of us have anything to compare it to. Um, and, and, you know, you hear all these news comparisons to the Spanish flu epidemic that happened, but sport looked incredibly different in the early 1900s compared to how it looks now. So there's really no precedent for this. So a lot of the information that I'm giving today is based on athlete injury, athlete transition. Um, I, I really just hope that you're able to take something from this presentation that you can you know, apply in your own life. And honestly, while I am looking at it through a sport lens, a lot of these things are just gonna apply to kids and teenagers in general, communication, how to relate to them, how to empathize, things like that. So hopefully across the board, you can take something away that you can use in your own life. Okay, so just a reminder, sending questions, sending comments as we go through, we'd love to hear from you guys. It's really great at the end of the presentation for the Q&A to get some feedback and have some questions. So we're gonna jump in and transition over. We're gonna start talking a little bit about transitions and crisis. Okay, so we're gonna dive into the idea of crisis today. Um, so before we have a crisis, we experience an unexpected transition. This is the case in our lives regardless. You lose your job. It's an unexpected transition. You um, go through a breakup or a divorce. You have an unexpected pregnancy. These are things that come up as adults that we then have to rearrange our lives. Well, for kids, these unexpected transitions, they have no basis for, so they can experience a crisis that comes out of that. Some athletes are going to handle those transitions really well. Um, we'll talk about what helps them when we come up in a minute next, um, but some of them are going to have, are not going to handle these transitions well, and that's what's going to lead to that experience of crisis, that feeling of being stuck and unable to get out of where you are. Um, when we look at athlete crisis and transition, normally this is following an unexpected injury or an unexpected into a season or an athletic career. So tearing your ACL, breaking your leg, breaking your collarbone, having the last concussion you're allowed to have before you get put out of sport. Um, COVID is this whole other thing that no one was prepared, was prepared for. It was an unexpected end to everything. It ended sports mid-season. It kept winter sports from having their banquets, or some of them were hours away from their state championships that they couldn't play in. Um, spring sports, you know, they had three, four games, didn't get to have senior night. And then fall sports right now can't condition, can't do preseason workouts, can't have team meetings. So it caused an, an unexpected transition for every single athlete. No one was excluded from that. 
And it stopped being this individual experience and became a full on sport experience across the board. Um, then their seniors, they had this other level of transitional crisis because of the major milestone moments. So if you have a senior athlete, that's a whole other ball game because they went through this two, three, four times in the span of two months. Now, if you have a senior at home, I really encourage you to go onto our website, famsolutions.org, click on the news tab in the menu, and you're gonna see in the Facebook section, a recent blog post that came out from Becca Cash. She's one of our outpatient therapists. She wrote this incredible blog post on 2020 seniors and transition and milestones. Um, and it's got some really helpful hands-on things that you can do. So definitely go check out the blog. It's also on our Facebook um, if you wanna look through that. So she kind of gives some information on that as well. Um, but we need milestones. We value them. Things like graduation and prom and athletic banquets and state championships because it indicates to us internally the passage of time um, that we're moving from one phase of life to the next phase of life. Okay. It's, it's like a honeymoon, right? It gives you that time to go from planning a wedding to being in a marriage. There's a transition time, there are milestones. And without those things to indicate to us what's going on, we can feel stuck, like the turtle that's on this slide. We can start to regress, we can start to move backwards. Um, our realities feel wrong. We start to doubt, did I accomplish this? Are these things real? What's really going on? And it's hard to move on to the next step. So this lack of clear transitions for most athletes in this case, it's finishing their, their season normally. This can cause this internal identity crisis. Who am I? Who should I be? And we don't get to experience those milestones. Things we've been told our entire lives are important. Graduation, it's this big moment you lead up to it your whole life. Playing in a state championship, you lead up to it your whole life. That can cause grief and loss and this developmental regression. That is the example of the developmental crisis, okay? This type of crisis from transition can be resolved by two things. One, personal growth. We learn and we adapt and we change. Or two, things in our life change to allow us to meet the challenge. But we can't do that with COVID. We can't change COVID. We can't impact what's happening. There are too many unknowns. We don't even know if sport is going to happen this upcoming year. So as parents, the place where you can impact and help your athlete is to work with the personal growth portion, that first part of this healthy way to come out of transition. Um, so we're going to talk about this over the next few slides, I'm going to offer you guys some hands-on approaches and things that you can do in your own home. But I encourage you um, to remember that this is individual for every athlete. So it's not, these are not blanket approaches to things. You know your kids, you know it's going to work for them. And just be patient as they adapt to these changes. Okay, so next we're going to talk a little bit about impacts and things that you can look for as a parent. So if you have an athlete at home who seems like they're struggling with these transitions, um, they may be at the point of crisis. Something is going on. Um, these are things for you to look out for. If you look kind of on the, the left side of the screen, you're going to see this list of things to keep an eye out for. Um, you're going to notice loss of appetite, potentially, some weight fluctuations, insomnia, mood changes, that's a big one, um, this sense of being out of control, feeling a little lost, um, sadness, sadness about the loss of their team and the environment, a decline in engagement and motivation, I've been hearing that from a lot of the parents that I work with, um, and just this lack of trust in others, things don't seem normal. Now, this list is sourced from things to look for following an injury or following a transition. It absolutely applies now to this COVID situation as well. Now, when you're noticing these things, it might be time to step in and provide some additional support. A lot of these signs correlate to depression. Um, and that may be a sign that your athlete's mental health is not in a great place and they need some other resources. Um, so I want you to take a look at the iceberg picture on this page. Um, we use the iceberg image a lot in counseling for different reasons, but I really love this one in particular. Um, it, the idea that what we see on the surface at the top is not always 
the truth. It's not always what's really going on underneath. So in this case, your kid might say they're fine. How are you doing? I'm fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. Um, and underneath there's all these other emotions and all these other things going on. And I really resonated with the speech bubble at the bottom that says, help, I'm drowning here. That's how we can really feel stuck under the water, unable to get back out. Um, we, as, we as a society are really taught to tuck tough emotions away. Don't talk about them, don't show them, shove them up under the rug. Um, and that's what this iceberg really resonates with, is these things that are down underneath. Now, the hard part as parents is that you guys are the ones who kind of have to uncover what's going on to dig down underneath and see what's really happening with your athlete. Um, that's why I think, you know, this is a good representation because they may not know what to say. It's not always this intentional um, lying or covering. Sometimes it's just, I don't have the words and I don't know what to do. Um, so in this case, I think it's helpful to have this in relation to all the things that are listed on the other side, because you can even use this iceberg. You can go to your child and say, here's this picture. And I feel like some stuff is going on underneath the surface with you. What do you think is in the bottom of your iceberg? With clients a lot, I'll give them a blank one and ask them to fill it in. Now this image, I'm going to give you guys a couple Instagram accounts that can be helpful as we go through today. There's this amazing company, uh, they're a UK company called the Blurt Foundation, B-L-U-R-T. Their Instagram is at the Blurt Foundation. And that's where this image is from. And they talk about mental health and they have a lot of great resources as well. So if you want to give them a follow, you can pull some of these resources and that's where you can find this actual image. Um, so one way to support your athlete at home, if, you, if this is something you really want to start at home trying to work with them, you're noticing some of these things, you still don't know if they need other resources, um, it's to help them build lasting coping skills, things that they can take into um, their adulthood, take into the rest of their life and apply now and in the future. So we're gonna talk about that next. Um, and building coping skills is something that we do in therapy with athletes all the time. Sometimes it's on the field coping skills, sometimes it's off the field coping skills. Um, but we're going to give you some ideas of ways that you can apply this in your own home, in your own way. Um, and I want to just reiterate that if you're local, if you're located in Greensboro, Burlington, Archdale, the surrounding areas, we are taking clients and doing teletherapy sessions. So if, if you're noticing these things in your child and you feel like you need some outside help, you can go online, famsolutions.org, fill out an online referral form, and our intake specialist will get you set up with a therapist who's a really good fit um, for what your specific needs are for you or for your children. Um, so just to make sure that you guys know that that is out there, okay? So we're going to shift a little bit to coping with transitions. Um, as adults, we have coping skills that help us adapt, right? As an adult, you have an adult perspective on life. It's the same with COVID, right? We have life experiences. We've dealt with grief. We've dealt with loss. We've dealt with national tragedies as adults. But this generation is too young to remember 9-11. So for them, this is it. This is the big national tragedy. And they don't necessarily have the coping skills to adapt to this. It's new. They've never done it before. And it's also really difficult for us to adapt when we don't know where the end is, right? When we don't know what has happened. I, I think a lot about like relation to going through a divorce. There is an end moment, the paperwork is signed, that is done. We don't have that. We have no idea what's going on. We don't know what the upcoming sports season is gonna look like. We can't give concrete answers when we're asked for them. Um, However, it's important for us to try to give them support and give them clear answers when we can and when we're able to. Um, so, you know, I say to my clients a lot, you're doing the best you can with the information you have at this time. And this is a prime example of this. You as parents are doing the best you can with the information that's being provided to you by your school districts or by the state and the governor and by national example. You're really trying to figure it out as you go. Um, and so with the grain of salt, as we help them cope with transition, there's space to give yourself grace that you're doing the best you can with what you know right now. So part of helping student athletes manage this transition is helping them build coping skills that can be applied across the board to major life events. So dealing with transitions successfully, that's what's listed on this side, is determined by two factors 
coping resources. So what are the skills in my toolbox to handle what's going on? And two, barriers, literal physical barriers to what's happening. We're gonna break these down over the next three slides. So we'll just give a very brief overview right now. Um, so we all know athletes who can push themselves beyond pain, seem to have a really high tolerance, can really just push themselves to go. And then we know the athletes who get a toe cramp and they're down for the whole game. I definitely was the toe cramp athlete, right? One little thing happened, I'm down, I'm done, I can't go back out, the world has ended, there were probably tears. So those two people, I, me versus someone else, those people have different coping skills. It's not about pain tolerance, it's about the ability to push past adversity. Um, the same is going to apply to COVID. Kids who have been through traumatic situations, who've been forced to deal with change, who've been forced to deal with transition, injury, grief, those kids are going to have more coping skills just naturally tucked inside their toolbox. They've lived through these things before. So that's part one. Part two is the literal barriers. So this could be transportation, access to food, access to technology, internet, family support, social support. COVID-19 in a lot of ways has brought to light the needs of some of these kids um, and athletes who face real, physical, literal barriers, they may struggle to cope even if they have strong coping skills. A lot of times those things go hand in hand. So knowing your kid's ability, what coping skills they have, what barriers are they facing, that's gonna help you know how to assist them moving forward. So let me just give, I'll use my childhood as an example. My husband and I were talking about this the other day, how different COVID would have looked for us as kids than it does for these kids now. Um, but so when I was a teenager, if COVID had happened, my Parents were divorced and they were living in separate cities, so I couldn't go from house to house. My mom's job definitely would have made her work from home. We had very poor Wi-Fi because I grew up in a very rural area, so we wouldn't have had good internet. We would have only been able to afford one computer in the house. So my mom doing work from home and me doing school from home or logging in for team Zoom meetings or whatever, those, those wouldn't have happened easily. So all of those things would have been my literal barriers to engagement, to involvement, and to success. So those would have been things that I would have had to have come up with the solutions for as a teenager, okay? So let's transition and talk about what you can do with this information. So this is gonna be the hands-on portion of the presentation. So I've outlined a few specific ways for you to help your athlete build coping skills. I wanted to give you something really tangible and hands-on that you could take away from this presentation. And we're gonna start talking about co-regulation, which is something that we try to use a lot in therapy. Co-regulation is something that we use when we are working with someone or talking with someone who's in distress. They're upset, they're overwhelmed, they're de dealing with heavy, big emotions. They're experiencing it in the moment, okay? Each of us does this differently. Some people withdraw, some people sob hysterically, some people yell and punch walls, right? Everybody reacts differently, but distress is distress. Um, and I remember one time, hearing a presenter say that two dysregulated people can't solve a problem. So marriage and couples is a good example of this. If both people are dysregulated, they're both up here in distress, you're never going to come to a resolution of a problem because both people are alone in this experience up here. They're not together. But if one person is regulated, they're down here, they're calm. One person is up here, they can meet and some calmness and some resolution can happen. Um, so that's how I want you guys to think about it. If your kid is upset, crying, extremely emotional, yelling, or just totally withdrawn, not saying anything, then nothing positive can come from that if you're in the same place. If you're also up here, then you're, you're never really gonna be able to talk and, and have that connection, have that communication. And let's be honest, a lot of teens are good at the big emotions. Big can either look like a ton or none. There's not normally a lot of middle ground when we're talking about teenagers in particular. Um, so co-regulation is a way for you as a parent to go into the situation calmly using some of the tips that are listed here and bring your child down. It happens very naturally. That's what these tips are great for. It's something you aren't having to say, we're going to co-regulate now, right? You can just 
start to do these things, it feels very natural. They probably won't notice and they're going to kind of come down. It's like tethering a balloon. It's something to tie into. Okay. So the great thing about this is that if we do it enough and we do it consistently, other people are able to do it naturally. So the more you can engage in this way with your teenager, the more likely they're going to be to do this on their own. So over time, they can manage these distressing emotions on their own. Okay, so the list over here on the side is really helpful. And there's an Instagram tag at the very bottom. It's at sit with wit. Um, not me, different Whitney. Um, and this is a therapist who posts amazing things on Instagram. She talks a lot about co-regulation. She posts these graphics. That's where this picture is from. Um, so if you want to look her up, I'd check that one out too. Um, so I, I like the list that's here, but I also, my favorite one is the one that's in this image. It's this idea of breathing near someone, breathing evenly, calmly, deeply, um, and because studies show that we regulate to the people around us. If you and another person are sitting side by side on a couch, studies show that your breath is going to take on the same rhythm. Sometimes you can do that with pets too, which is just an interesting side note. Um, but if your child is upset and they're distressed and they're not breathing, when we're crying, we're not breathing correctly. When we're stressed out and overwhelmed, we're not breathing correctly. You sitting beside them, being calm, breathing evenly is going to help. Okay, it's kind of magical in that way. So this also points out that telling someone to calm down doesn't normally help them calm down. And I'm sure a lot of you have experienced that. If I'm upset and my husband looks at me and says, just calm down, probably not what I'm gonna do, right? So it's the same with breathing. If someone's not breathing well and you look at them and say, just breathe, probably not going to get what you want, but if you model it and you do it, it's going to get you there. Okay. Um, so co-regulation, it's just this hands-on great way of taking someone down from this high emotional mountain, this high peak and bringing them down to a place where they can really function. Okay. So we do on this next slide, I'm going to cover some information and then we're going to jump into a little video. So that's what this image is. It's a little, it's a little YouTube clip. Um, these are some more examples of real hands-on real life ways that you can help your athletes. So like I've mentioned before, it's so important to take them seriously. This feels big because this is big. I can't imagine going through this as a teenager. Teenage dumb is hard enough as it is, might as well having an actual pandemic happening at the same time. So there are the facts, right? I missed graduation. I missed prom. I didn't get to finish my season. I never even got to play. It was my first year on the varsity team and I didn't get any playing time. Those are the facts. Underneath those facts are the feelings. I feel disappointed. I feel like a failure. I feel lonely. I feel isolated. Those are the emotions that are underneath. So using emotion based language is a great modeling tool for your children. It's going to help them learn how to talk about feelings, right? I feel as a sentence starter is so, so powerful and really impactful. When you open your feelings, you talk about them out loud, you're giving permission to the other people in your life to talk about their feelings as well. So as a parent saying, I feel really disappointed that I'm not going to get to cheer you on this year. It's making me feel really sad can lead to them saying, I'm really sad too. I feel super disappointed. And this is really hard. And that is the foundation for a conversation that's going to move you forward. So once the conversation is started, the second part is identifying central issues versus peripheral issues. Okay. Um, it's very possible that COVID is not actually the central issue for your athlete. And right now there's this magnifying glass on COVID, but there could be other issues going on underneath that are actually more present and more impactful for your athlete. So identifying that central issue can help you know where to put your energy. So here's an example. So let's say that your kid played a spring sport. Okay. Softball. Softball is a great example. So softball is happening and there's team cohesion problems. There's drama, as we like to say. Then COVID happens. It could be possible that if your athlete seems like they're in crisis or they're distressed, that it's actually related to that team cohesion problem that was never solved versus COVID. 
So once you've identified the central issue, some of the, that peripheral stuff, some of those other things will fall away. So the second part of this conversation is figuring out what the actual problem is. And then once you've figured out the issues, you're able to talk about feelings, then you can start setting some goals, some small, small achievable things that your athlete can actually do. So maybe they aren't working out right now, but they want to start. You can help them come up with a workout plan. Maybe their grades are slipping, their schoolwork is slipping because they aren't motivated. You can maybe sit them down and help them come up with a schedule, some sort of engagement like that. But one thing that is super important, and this is going to tie us into this video, is empathy. It's really, really important when you're setting goals, okay? It's easy as adults to fall into problem-solving mode. Or my personal favorite is just aggressively being like, let me show you how much I understand, okay? And that can quickly become this, my problems are bigger than your problems. We want to connect with people and we want to say, here's an experience I went through that's similar to yours, but we also don't want to make it a competition with kids right? We want them to feel like we understand that their situation is important. So that's how empathy um, comes into play. So we're, we're going to pull up this clip. This is from Brene Brown. Some of you have probably heard of her. She has a great Netflix special and a lot of TED Talks. This is a little animated short that was created to go with her topic of empathy. And she just explains really well what empathy looks like. So we're going to play this really quickly, and then we'll come back and continue with the presentation. Okay. Yeah. So that's the end of that. That that video, that clip gets me every time. Um, I really love how she addresses the at least part. Okay. So let's apply that a little bit to your athletes. At least you can play next year. At least you got part of your season. At least you played your other years of school. Sometimes those at least statements make us feel incredibly small, incredibly insignificant. And there's this other component that she mentioned a little bit of empathy and empathetic listening. It's not feeling like you have to solve the problem. 
You can always play intramural in college. You can always do pickup games at the Y, right? Those are solutions, but that's not necessarily helpful in the moment. Empathetic listening helps you listen without judgment and be present in those tough emotions. So the last component of this potential successful transition, one, remember, is building coping skills, and the second is managing barriers. So I'm going to quickly touch on how you can help your athlete manage the physical, literal barriers that they experience. Some barriers we can't help. We can't impact how much money we make. We can't impact what transportation is available to us right now. Um, we can't impact how fast our internet runs or when it rains so hard that the internet goes down and they miss some school Zoom meeting, right? But we can impact how we talk to them, how we set boundaries, how we schedule our time. Control what you can control, okay? It's a waste of energy to try to change unchangeable things. Use that energy to fuel what you actually can change. Secondly, think outside the box and go outside of your comfort zone. Maybe you don't have the transportation ability to take your athlete somewhere to practice, but you have a basketball and you live in an apartment that has a parking lot and you can go outside and you can play a pickup game with them, right? Not only is that engagement with them, but it fuels connection. And lastly, don't flood them. We do this a lot as adults. Things that are helpful for us as adults are not always helpful for kids or teens, like creating schedules, right? I love a schedule and I like it written down. And I like it color coded and I check things off when I'm done. But to a teenager, that might be super overwhelming and create a lot of anxiety. So talk to them, ask if something is working. And if it's not working, be flexible and be willing to change. So now we're going to talk about something that's really tough. We're going to talk a little bit about grief. Now, we associate grief most frequently with death. I'm gonna reframe that word a little bit here. Grief, as I mean it, is related to loss. Loss of a season, loss of teammates, loss of a safe place to go after school, loss of relationships with coaches. Athletes don't exist in a void. Their sport is deeply in interconnected with their life. And like many of us know, for some athletes, this is the thing that keeps them engaged in school. This is the thing that keeps them going, keeps them motivated. So when that has been taken away, they are experiencing a lot of grief. So this could look like internalizing. It could look like withdrawing. We see this a lot in teams, this sense of why is this happening to me? What did I do to deserve this? Remember that teens are in this developmental phase where they feel like they're under a microscope and that everything is happening to them. They take it very personally. So this graphic that's on the right is um, gonna be really helpful. I really like this one a lot. It gives you some hands-on tools for talking about grief. So loss, whether it's experiential, like losing sport, or whether it's literal, like lo losing a person, um, it's really awkward for us to talk about as outsiders. And let's be honest, it's why Southerners just take food, right? We don't know how to talk about things, but we're going to make you a casserole, and we're going to hand it to you, and we're going to walk away. So it's totally understandable if this part of grief with your athlete, you just don't know how to have that conversation. That's fine. It isn't always about talking, it's about being present and it's about empathy and opening the avenue for communication when they are ready to talk, okay? We want our athletes to remember that they matter to us as individuals, that we respect this experience that, that they're going through. And we may see them go through the traditional stages of grief, okay? Um, so we may see some anger, some denial, Things like that might come up a lot, but this graphic is really helpful to help talk about different things that you can do in real life, asking questions or acknowledging big dates. If they're, cause I can tell you, my husband is a coach. They know what these dates are. If they were supposed, if your spring athletes are supposed to be doing their state playoffs and their state championships, they know that that was supposed to be happening. Acknowledging those things out loud can be helpful. And just letting them feel the emotions can be helpful as well. So use this graphic as a guide to kind of help you think of things that you can do in this situation. Um, so let's, let's get a little hands-on. Let's talk about how we help heal from grief. Hands-on, things we can do in real life 
to help our athletes. So the slide that we're going to go to in a minute is probably my favorite slide. I love a good intervention. I love a good hands-on activity. So I've listed a few hands-on activities that you can do at home to help with grief, to help with loss, to talk about emotion, set some goals, start planning the future. So we're going to go by, through these one by one and a few of them I've put image examples to go with them. So the first thing is going to be um, game engagement. So uh, sports provide a way for kids to make their family proud, impress their friends and peers, receive praise, be competitive. And for many young athletes, this is an important developmental step. It's how they develop their identity. Um, it's also part of developing self-esteem. So during this time of self-isolation, finding activities that can help your athlete engage in these ways, encourage healthy competition, ways to show off a bit, ways to receive praise, um, that can build that self-esteem. It can be as simple as a family board game night, can be as involved as a, um, I, I saw a parent on Facebook say that their kid had engaged in a Zoom um, pickup game. They played horse through Zoom out in their yard. That's awesome, right? So that might be part of what game engagement looks like. Um, I've got this image of a um, memory ornament that you'll see up there. I really love memory ornaments. It's this great thing for, in particular, for kids who are more sentimental. They keep mementos of things. So the idea is you get a clear plastic ornament from a craft store and you fill it with things that are important. So that could be maybe your kid wore the same shirt to practice every day and you cut it into strips and you put it in the ornament or you have um, like ticket stubs from games or their, their sport program for the year. I even, I had a client once fill it with dirt from his cleats. Um, so it looked like a ornament full of dirt, but for him, it was really sentimental to have a tangible piece of the field that he played on. Um, and then on the outside, you can put a note on it, like it's on this ornament, or you can write on it the year, maybe some mementos and notes like that. Now, for the kid who is not so sentimental, a way to engage could be creating a highlight reel. A lot of kids have access to programs like Huddle or other digital places where their film is stored. And looking back on good memories, looking back on highlights and building something like this, it can provide hope for the future, brings back good memories, things like that. So utilizing those tools as well to help bring back some positive memories. Um, the college search picture you see, that's from cfnc.org, um, which is a North Carolina site. College planning can be an awesome tool for looking into the future and feeling hopeful. And CFNC has this tool. You go to cfnc.org, you're going to click on plan, and then you're going to click the link for college search. And this map comes up. And underneath it are all these filters. So what sports are available, how many people go there, what's the teacher to student ratio, what's the male to female ratio, what programs they offer. And it'll filter and it'll put little pins at where all of the schools are that match your criteria. And you can actually expand the map and show the entire United States. So that could be a good tool to sit down with your athlete and start planning what they want their future to look like. Okay, now another one that I've put on here is a family workout challenge. This may not work for your family, but it may work for some. There's a lot of workout challenges happening on TikTok and Instagram and Twitter right now. So getting engaged with your kids, doing something physical. We know that physical activity is wonderful for feelings of depression and sadness, right? It does a lot to lift your mood. And then adding competitiveness for your athlete could also be really helpful. Videotape it, put it online, and that's just a great way to engage with them. Um, now on here, it's called a happiness jar. I call it a positivity jar. It's different for everyone, but the idea is to take a jar and you fill it with things that make you happy. A lot of times I'll have clients write down positive messages once a day on a post-it and they stick it in the jar. Some people fill it up with positive mementos like ticket stubs and things like that. Um, I've even done it where family members put in positive things about different family members, little love notes almost. But the idea is you have a receptacle, a container that is full of good things so that when you feel bad, you're able to go and look back through those and feel really uplifted. Um, and lastly, I put on here journaling. Journaling is not for everyone. I just want to acknowledge that getting a 17 year old to write about their feelings, not the easiest task. And if we can't talk about our feelings, sometimes it's easier to write about them. So maybe encouraging your athlete at home to write about their feelings and really engage with journaling, that can be a, a helpful outlet for them. So we've talked a lot about things for you to do as parents. 
So, um, you know, as a parent, you've had these hard talks, you've helped with healing activities, you've done homeschooling, you've cleaned the house, you've cooked 10,000 meals at this point, you've gone to the grocery store more than you can count, you've done all the dishes, you've washed the bathroom floors, you've done all these things. And then the question is what's left for you? I asked this of a client once who has four children and I asked her what she had done for herself and she just broke out into tears. And a lot of you are in that place. You're being asked to learn new skills. You're being asked to juggle a lot of things. So this slide that we're about to put up, this slide is for you as parents, okay? Being a parent of a child who's struggling, particularly emotionally, that can be so draining and so exhausting as a parent. And you can start to feel like you're failing them, okay? So when we aren't at our best, it's really hard to give to others. You can't pour from an empty pitcher. That's the sort of Southern phrase around that. Um, so to all of you out there who are just trying to hold it together, here are some things for you guys, okay? First, this is a reminder that you don't have to do it all and that it's okay to change your mind. You don't have to stick to a rigid schedule. You don't have to take on more than you can handle. And if you started trying something, I remember right at the start of all this, seeing on Facebook all these posts of parents who had made these like 30 minute increment schedules for their kids. It is realistic that at week 10, that schedule has been physically thrown out of your home, right? That you just can't do it. And that's okay. It's okay to change and adapt and it's okay to give up things that aren't working, okay? Then, you know, being able to say no, that's something that a lot of us work really hard to be able to do. So as parents, you can say no. If coaches or teachers or schools or neighbors are asking you to step up and do things, you can set boundaries for yourself. Um, you're being asked to do so much during this crisis. It's okay to not be able to do it all. Okay. And then being emotionally vulnerable is really, it works best when it's modeled. We can't say to our kids, sit down and tell me about your feelings if we aren't willing to model that and do that ourselves. So modeling that vulnerability, one, it's great because you can talk about the things that you're struggling with, not having to be perfect, and it helps your kids learn that it's okay for them to be vulnerable as well. So I did a webinar last week, a similar subject, but for coaches and ADs, and I mentioned in that webinar how much I talked to my husband about hope and athletics and how important I think hope is in athletics. Um, for me, it's this incredible, like magic ingredient for success. Hope in truth is just a strong imagination mixed up with this belief that things can be better. And it's a huge part of that goal setting that we talked about earlier. Having a goal gives kids the opportunity to imagine a better future. Engagement with players through social media and communication, it can provide that kind of hope. Kids need that social engagement with their teammates. And when they're able to engage with their teammates, engage with their coaches, then they can start to imagine putting on a uniform, making a shot, winning their championships, wearing that championship ring, and without hope, we can get really lonely and really lost. So hope is kind of this brightly colored wrapping paper that goes around the goals that we set. So it helps to build hope by focusing on accomplishments. Focusing on the, focusing on the good stuff can really relieve some of this pressure of all the bad news and things that are going on that we're getting right now. Um, and there's also been several articles that have come out recently about how focusing on the self-sacrifice element of this can really be beneficial, especially for teenagers, encouraging them and saying, you are doing this, you are staying home, you gave up your season, you're giving up conditioning, giving up this time with your teammates to help other people feel safe, to help other people stay healthy. That is one way that we can refocus them onto the big picture of things. Um, and lastly, just touching on this idea of not dwelling on the past. We as humans have this fascination with focusing on what we could have done differently, the what ifs, the toxic what ifs, right? Hindsight's 2020. But when we focus on the past, we aren't able to look at the future. You can't look two directions at the same time. So helping your athletes set these goals, start to work towards the future, not forcing them into it, but encouraging it is a way to get them out of this stuck place of being in the past, okay? And nothing really is more hopeful than moving into the future. So the last thing we're going to talk about today is some future considerations, a little bit about uh, NCAA, a little bit about scholarship stuff. Um, so the NCAA is still in the process of making 
long-term decisions. Like we said earlier, that feels almost impossible without an end date, without a lot of information. Um, there are a lot of individual decisions that are having to go on. Um, now, the decisions that have been made have already been posted by the NCAA. They have a specific COVID-19 resource page, and I've got the link on the slide for this um, so that you guys can see that. There will definitely be more announcements in the future. I do encourage you guys to go on to the NCAA's COVID page. You can just Google NCAA COVID resources and that page is gonna come up as well. You're gonna wanna look at things for graduating seniors. If you've got seniors or upcoming juniors in your household, you wanna look at um, future college athletes, the information they have on there about that. And then look at athlete eligibility as well. Um, now, different states are going to make different decisions. Two weeks ago, Arizona announced that they would start summer workouts, that everything would proceed like normal. Within 24 hours, California announced that they were going to stay in a three-month lockdown. So every state is going to manage it differently, and that's going to be a helpful conversation to have with your athletes. North Carolina is going to make different choices than South Carolina. And if you have athletes and travel teams, if you have athletes who are playing sports that have to go across state lines to find competition, if your kid's in an independent school and you're used to going to Tennessee and going to Virginia and going all these places to play, different state decisions, that's gonna impact a lot of how your child is able to engage and play. So just having that conversation with them and remembering too that sports, especially in school, are gonna be determined by the decision to go back to school. So even though maybe one of the high school athletic organizations has given the thumbs up for June 1, if your school system doesn't, then that's gonna impact it as well. So trying to stay on top of those decisions and have those honest conversations with your kids is gonna be really helpful. Um, okay, and when it comes to scholarships, this one is, is tough because there are so many unknowns and every school is gonna handle it differently. So this is not sport related, but Elon University just announced in the last few days that they will not be requiring test scores for the next three years, I think. Um, look into that if you have questions about it. But that's an example of a private institution making a choice for their institution. The same is gonna happen with scholarship opportunities. A lot of programs have no idea what their funding is going to look like in the next year or the next five years because of the impact of this. If colleges aren't able to play in the fall or the spring, that's going to impact funding as well. So if you are already in communication with some of the high school reach out people at these schools, ask them questions and understand and try to be flexible that they may not have the answer right now. So just stay engaged, work with your coaches, work with the colleges, and know that these decisions are forthcoming and some of these decisions are dependent on what the NCAA decides is gonna happen. Um, so they may not have the answers, but hopefully as things come through, they will. And if you have specific questions about things like that or specific concerns, feel free to email them to me. If I can't answer them, I will find the resources for you for those questions to be answered. Whew, okay, so that was a straight almost 50 minutes of me talking. So we're going to take a little break. Um, we are going to transition into a Q&A portion. I don't know how many questions we have. If you have questions, send them through the chat feature. We're going to answer them as we can. We've got about 10 minutes left. Um, my email contact is up here. My phone contact is up here. Please write down my email and email me with specific questions, particularly if you have personal questions that you aren't comfortable putting in the chat feature. I really am more than happy to answer questions. And if I can't answer them, I'll find somebody who can. Um, so we're going to pull up this and see if we have any questions, comments, hellos, um, waiting for us in the chat feature. Um, and please continue to send those in if you have them. Okay, and I do see on here that some people have said that they've had trouble hearing the video clip. If you go to YouTube and you search um, for Brene Brown, B-R-E-N-E -E, Brown, empathy. It's going to be the first clip that comes up. You'll see the little bear and the little fox, about two and a half minutes. It's a really great clip. So if you can't um, find this, then just YouTube it and you'll be able to find it up there. Okay. Um, let's see. Thank you, Chiquita. Uh, <laughs> so it's really good to see some counselors on here as well. Jaquita Alexander is one of the counselors over at Southern Guilford High School. Um, 
So it's nice to see, I'm seeing some uh, familiar names pop up. So it's, it's really nice to hear from some of you guys. And if you are a counselor, if you are a professional and not a parent, and you have questions about how to apply some of these things to your program, or if you happen to be a coach, um, let me know. We did record our coaches webinar from last week, and we have even more um, tips of the trade for those of you who are working in a professional capacity. I also have all of my research that I use for this webinar, and a lot of it has very easy to apply tips for counselors. Some of them even have scripts and dialogue and then research articles that have been published about how to help athletes in transition. So if you're a professional and you want some of this research information, let me know. I'll send you articles. I'll let you know where I got this information from. I'm happy to share. Okay, so I don't think we have any other questions coming up. If you have anything, go ahead and send it in because we're going to transition soon um, away from this. Yeah, I do recognize I'm seeing some, some counselor names. I'm seeing, and also my husband, uh, <laughs> which I think is the point that Chris is trying to make. Um, thank you guys so much for being here with us today. We appreciate you taking time out of your schedule. Um, once again, we are taking referrals for new clients. Um, let's see, we actually did just get a question. Okay, so the question is, what are some good questions to ask a teenager who could either be withdrawn or could be just fine? Um, so that's going to be sort of individual to your kid. If you're talking about your own child, um, that's going to look one way versus if you're a professional who's talking to someone who's a client. Um, really, I think good questions to ask are, how are you feeling today? Um, I noticed that you're sleeping a lot more lately. Do you feel like you're getting some good sleep? Um, I noticed that you don't seem to be eating as much or you're not really engaged with your friends. Do you want to talk about what's going on? And if you notice, a lot of those questions come from observation. So if you're noticing that your child is withdrawn, which on could look like no motivation. It could look like odd eating habits or odd engagement habits with the family. Pointing out things that you've noticed helps that kid feel seen. Oh, what I'm doing is not invisible and they do notice what's going on. Um, so I'll give an example. I have a client who um, has missed like three or four Zoom meetings in a row with me, sessions with me. And so reaching out to him and saying, this doesn't feel like you. This feels a little outside the norm for you. Can you tell me a little bit about what's going on? Um, and just open-ended questions. So open-ended questions are going to open up the opportunity for a real response versus a yes or no or a one-word response. Um, so I just encourage observations of what's going on, pointing out those observations, and then asking open-ended questions, and really being patient. I think the biggest thing I took from uh, my counselor training in general was learning to sit in silence. It's not something most of us are good at. But to ask an open-ended question and say, how are you really feeling about what's going on right now? And then being willing to wait and be patient and give them room to collect their thoughts and respond to it. Um, that can be super helpful as well. Okay, so yeah. So I mean, I, I definitely echo, we never ever want kids, in general kids, teens, little children to feel abnormal. I just want to normalize this situation that we are all absolutely struggling to adjust to this. And sometimes it's helpful to use yourself as an example. So maybe you want to go to your child. Maybe they've been missing Zoom meetings with their teacher or they're not turning in Canvas assignments or they've had team meetings with their coaches and the coach reaches out and says, you know, John wasn't in his meeting this week. Going to them and saying, you know, I've been struggling too with work. I just feel really frozen and stuck and I don't know how to engage. Um, do you feel like that's going on with you? And relating it to yourself and normalizing that this is a human experience. Depression is a human experience. Grief is a human experience. Um, and it's something that a lot of us go through in our lives, especially in our early lives. Just that normalization can be super helpful whenever you're trying to engage. Okay, so last minute or two to ask any extra questions questions if you guys have them um, I just want to reiterate how grateful I am for you guys taking an hour out of your day um, to be here and engage with me um, and engage with Chris who's on the other side of the camera um, once again if you do have 
um, your own children or an athlete or a student or a client who you think could use some external resources. We have incredible therapists here at our agency. Um, we are taking clients for teletherapy sessions. Um, you can go to fam, F-A-M, solutions.org and you'll be able to find our online referral page there. My email is here, my work phone number is here, so if you have any questions about those referrals, just shoot me an email. Um, and once you send in a referral, our intake specialist will get up with you. Um, we do take Blue Cross Blue Shield, we also take Medicaid, we also take private pay, um, and we have some incredible intake specialists who will get in touch with you and get you set up with the right person, um, and we can start sessions right away digitally. That's how we're handling it right now until we can get back in the office. So please, if you think that something is going on with your child or with another child or with one of your students or clients, um, get them in touch with us. We are happy to sit down and talk with them and do, do the best that we can. So, okay, we're going to go ahead and get wrapped up. This is, we did record this and we can email it to you if you want to share it with um, friends or colleagues. You can just send me an email and let me know and we will happily get this recording sent over to you. Um, I'm also going to be working on a resource list. Some of these Instagrams that I've said, the video links, some article links, things that would be helpful and we'll be getting that emailed out to all the participants participants um, in the next few weeks. So let me know. Let's reach out via email if you, there's anything else that you guys need. And thank you so much again for engaging with us today. We really appreciate it. Bye, everybody. Thanks so much.